Welcome to um, the latest of our Profs in the Pav. Just because we can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, just to say, if you do have any questions, please can you drop them into the comments and then we'll pick them up at the end of the, of the talk after Claire, Ellie and John have all spoken. So first of all, we've got Claire Gwinnett. And Claire is a professor in forensic and environmental science here at the university. Um, and she is internationally recognized for her forensic fiber work. Claire has led national and international products, uh, projects conducting research in the recovery, analysis, and interpretation of, of polymers, particularly synthetic fibers for the forensic industry and microplastics for environmental work since 2004. And over the years, she's worked on improving methods for microplastic pollution detection with international organizations, which has impacted on industry, the public sector, academia, and policymakers. And Claire is currently the director of the Center for Crime, Justice, and Security, and she conducts uh, research where she's the research lead for the Microplastic and Forensic Fibre Research Group, which is a multidisciplinary group. Then we'll be going over to Eleanor Harrison, and Ellie is a PhD student within the Microplastics and Forensic Fibre Research Group, and she leads the Terrestrial Microplastics Research Work. Her work specifically focuses on microplastics in agriculture with a view to understand the impact of this emerging pollutant on the soil and plant system. And then Finally, we've got uh, John Fairburn. John is a professor of sustainable development, and John has worked in the area of environmental justice for over 20 years. Uh, he was part of a team that carried out some of the first and biggest studies for the government departments in England, Scotland, and Wales. He contributes the air quality index to the index of multiple deprivation, which is used to allocate millions of pounds spent by the government, funders, and others. And for the last 10 years, he's been working with the World Health Organization, chairing panels of international experts and producing research for policymakers. He's currently part of the Environment Agency Air Quality Inequality Group and also sits on the environmental board for the UKRI Transitions Project. Uh, just a quick outline of the talk. Um, this is all about the science of uh, invisible pollution and the scale to which that impacts on health, finances and the environment. Um, and the talk is then going to go on to look at what people might actually do in response to this problem. So what might individuals do, for example? Um, the talk is also going to look at the distribution of air pollution and current policy developments. And there will be um, resources and references available for you to use after the talk. So just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please pop it into the chat bar and we'll come back to them to, at the end. Otherwise, I'm now going to pass over to Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you, everybody, for taking some time out tonight in order to be able to sort of listen to this lecture. It's coming up to Christmas. And although COVID has prevented a lot of our festive activities, it doesn't stop some Christmas shopping and also celebrating sort of just at home. So I'm really glad that um, you've come and decided to spend an hour listening to a topic that's really close to my heart and it's close to Ellie's and John's as well. Um, as a forensic scientist, I've been working with microplastics and polymers for over 16 years. And in the last five Five years I've really been interested in applying sort of my forensic knowledge of polymers and fibers um, in crime scenes and applying that to understanding how they affect the environment so looking at their presence in water land and in air and um, what I've got sort of tonight is the aim is to sort of bring this together and really sort of reflect on some of the sustainability goals that we are trying to achieve globally and as a university so um, John and I pair up really quite nicely because a lot of the goals that I try to understand a little bit more about and try to impact are around this sort of hu human health, good health and um, clean water and sanitation and helping improve life underwater, both for all of our animals and also on land as well. So trying to understand really what these pollutants are doing and getting a better methods in order to be able to understand what the best ways to deal with them are. So this is a great way to be able to do that is to bring my knowledge and it overlaps so neatly with John's who really looks about equality and, and pollution and what does that truly mean in terms of effect. So I'm going to kick off 
with some of, sort of the science and uh, sort of where my aspect and my expertise, which is very particular in terms of particulate matter and in microplastics and what that means now as a new emerging pollutant. And then I'm going to hand over to my PhD student who is going to talk about one of the major effects of that before John brings this all together. So just to sort of get us in the mood, let's think about what do we think when we someone says air pollution? Like what comes to mind? What's visual there? And I've just got this sort of image on the screen here of, and you may or may not recognize this, but it very much depicts what we think is a visible pollutant. This is the London smog incident in 1952, which for those of you who um, enjoy The Crown, you will know about because it gets uh, mentioned in that um, TV series. And you'll also know that it, it was deemed as attributed to 12,000 people's deaths. And that is a huge incident that was around that smog and air pollution really kicked off a lot of things moving forward from the 50s, including the Clean Air Act. But that look at that, looking at that image in, um, in London, let's look at one now just closer to home. And this is a postcard that's also from the 1950s that is um, stated as a little slogan there is fresh air from the potteries, which I'm not entirely sure how tongue in cheek that actually is. But what that image does do is it really shows what air pollution and what the air quality was like in the Stoke-on-Trent region because of the pottery industry back in the 1950s. Now, of course, a lot of things have changed since then. And even though we might not have a lot of visible type pollution that when well, we certainly still do, but we maybe see less of it now, um, it doesn't mean it's not there which is really what sort of inspired the, the title of this presentation. So where are we today and what kind of pollutants affect us? Um, I'm going to kick off this next bit. I just want to ask you a question. Now, I know I can't hear your answers at home, but I want you just to think, what, what, do you answer? what would you answer me? What would you yell out if this was in a pub quiz or if you were actually in the lecture theatre at Staffordshire University? Because um, really, these two questions really kind of highlight some of the impact and the, the breadth and the, the real size of this as a problem. So the first question is one um, about statistics at the World Health Organization that puts out in terms of trying to know who is affected by um, air pollution and to what extent. So just reading this question, what percentage of the world's uh, children under the age of 15 breathe polluted air that puts them at risk of developing serious health conditions? So, so that'll think there, what, what percentage do you think that is? And I'm going to show that answer now and see how close you got, but also whether this is a shocking or a surprising statistic. So 93% of children under the age of 15 are um, a put of risk but from air pollution. Let's go for the whole population now. And the World Health Organization gives an estimate of the amount of people who die every year from the exposure to polluted air. How many, of, how many people do you think die every year because of some factor that's been influenced through air pollution? And again, I find this an incredibly shocking and, um, statistic and seven million individuals are, are affected and ultimately die because of, of polluted air, which is it's a huge, huge amount. And we need to kind of understand how have we got to that position where we have got so many people affected, it affects pretty much everybody. And we say sort of nine out of 10 individuals are regularly are exposed to polluted air in some form or another. Um, but how do we get there? Like, why is this problem now still absolutely relevant? And if anything, getting potentially feeling like it's getting worse. So we have to think about well, what's happened over the years. And a major contributor to this is clearly the increase in world population. There are more of us, and therefore we've got more high reliance and more pressure on the systems that provide us with our livelihoods, with the, the goods that we need, with chemicals and with energy. So an increase in population has a direct effect on the, the needs from the energy industry from the chemical industry, from for products that we need, and also, of course, on transportation. So we, with there are more cars, and from more cars, we get more pollutants. And as a side sort of a part of that is, of course, the food that we eat. We, we need more food because there's more of us, and the, not only just in food production that produces these pollutants, but also the distribution and all the other sort of um, containers and all the things that we take for granted for protection of our food, they can also be a supplier of, of pollutants globally. And this is something where over the last um, 
sort of 40, 50 years, the pressure to have everything very um, easy to hand, very um, user friendly, things that are throw away. So single use type items that I talk about a lot and also talk about products that ultimately have, have got some sort of source of pollution. So seeing lots of single use plastics inevitably leads to more microplastics and leads to more pollution and things like the, the need for products like aerosols, of course, in air pollution as well. But we can't just see air pollution as one single source. We've got to think that air pollution is directly linked to water pollution, it's directly linked to land pollution. And it's very difficult to separate those because they're all connected. And the way these pollutants transfer between these different environments is important to know. And it also means that the effects of these pollutants, they're not just for us people, or people on land, there's also sea life and terrestrial life as well. So I like to always sort of think about what do we know as the public about air pollution based on what the media is telling us. So what kind of stories, what kind of information are we told? And I always like to do a little snapshot. So this is a little snapshot in just in the last six months of the type of news stories that have come out around air pollution. And what we can generally do is broadly group this type of information that we're told into either sources of air pollution, so like so one of those first couple of articles there, or the effects of pollution. So who is it affecting? How much is it affecting them? And what kind of diseases might be linked with this pollution? And then also the, I suppose that the happier stories, the remediation activities that are being put in place. What are governments doing? What are local councils doing in order to try and reduce our exposure to air pollution and try to minimize it at source? So we're told about a lot of this, this information and we get different pictures of where we are in the world of air pollution right now. But what, what I find when I speak to people is that when I sort of say, what do you know about air pollution? They might say, well, I understand some of the sources, but I actually don't know the types of air pollution that I'm exposed to. And there are a lot, but I'm just going to show you the main culprits. So I'm going to get a little lineup now of the main culprits of air pollution. So these are the these are the bad guys. These are the ones that um, we're interested very much in trying to understand in source and try to understand reduction. Um, but there are a lot, lot more than these, including um, sort of we think about um, ammonia and VOCs, volatile organic um, components. But these are some of some of the main ones. So when we think about carbon monoxide, a lot of that is around um, from processes and industries that use combustion. So when we do, you know, we're combusting fuels such as gasoline, natural gas and oil and coal, and that's where we're getting a major source of that from. We also get sources of this from the likes of so the aluminium industry and also upstream in the petroleum industry, seeing that there's lots of different factors here and different, diff, lots of different industries that are feeding into this source of pollution. Now, when we think of lead, major sources of lead in air are around um, ore and metals processing and and also the use of still leaded fuel in some way so the piston engine aircrafts operate on on leaded avian uh, aviation fuel and that will be a source as well into the air nitrogen um oxides and this is where we again we're talking about combustion and um, we're talking about um the major source of that being vehicles, but a lot of the any other combustion industry is also going to produce these nitrogens as well. So there's not one single source for each of these. This is a combined effort. But like I said, the major source of this, of course, is um, use of vehicles and exhausts, because again, we've got through that. We, we get high concentrations of this when we've got high motor vehicle traffic. And of course, the highest areas we see of this are in built up cities where this is all accumulated together. Now, a lot of people forget ozone. And that is, again, a source of, of pollutant. But a lot of people think of ozone in terms of the high ozone layer rather than the low ozone layer, which is surrounding in our layer that is over cities and over where we live. And ozone at this particular layer, layer is harmful. So what we, do, we, we want to try and minimize that. But the, the, what we get there is a lot of these other pollutants that are in the environment end up um, actually chemically reacting in the presence of sunlight. So what we end up is this sort of this smog and actually ozone is one of the major contributors or, or composition of smog. 
Then we've got particulate matter, something that I'm going to go on to a little bit more detail. And we get a lot of this from all different sources, factories, trucks, cars, residential sources, everything from industry. And a question that kind of comes up there a lot for me is, well, what do these PM things mean? So people will say um, there's PM10 or PM2.5. And all that generally means is these coarser particulates, so these bigger ones that have a diameter greater than 2.5 micrometers, and this is where we say PM10, it's more around 10 micrometers, we call them PM10. And it's 2.5 micrometers in size for that, for that PM2.5. And it's just really categorizing them based on those two sizes. And last but not least for now, just talk about sulfur dioxide, which is a, a corrosive acidic gas, but it, and it's predominantly uh, produced during the combustion of oil, um, coal and crude oil, both at an industrial level, but also at a residential level. So thinking in your own homes when we're having coal fires and we're having um, lovely wood burning stoves, again, this is a major source of sulfur dioxide. Now, when we sort of look at the breadth of, of where all these are coming from again we cannot point fingers in one direction they're coming from many different industry the industries that we're absolutely reliant as a human race where they come from agriculture and in that production of, of food and, and managing the land they come from our own houses and that is, is considerable when we talk about particulate matter because if we just check out on here there's a major source of particulates and then also, of course, our transportation. And many people think, well, if I avoid the roads completely and I don't drive and I have alternative transportation, am I, is, there, is there no air pollution from that? But of course, that's not true because it has its own sources of air pollution, albeit a lower amount than road transport. And of course, there are natural sources of these main pollutants. And, and a lot of the time we don't think about that. So lightning storms, electrical storms, they create ozone. Um, dust storms in themselves create particle uh, matters, and this is a uh, dust storm in India in the bottom left. Volcanoes, they produce ash and acidic components, and they can they produce carbon monoxide and nitrogen and sulfur, sulfur oxides. They produce the whole, a whole range. Wildfires, and we've seen a lot of those in 2020 in the US, they produce um, particulates again and combustion gases, and even sea spray which no one would ever sort of accuse of, of, of creating a pollution, but actually produces sulfur. So all of these effects together with both man-made and natural produce a real problem, something that is directly affecting us now. And there's a lot of work that's been done out there in terms of what the effects are. Um, and it's, it's not simple because when we talk about just the effect of air pollution, we, we shouldn't separate what is water pollution, soil contamination at the same time, because all of these are impacting our major organs and are leading to things like asthma, um, uh, cardiac, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease and cancers. And there are different mechanisms of entering the body, whether some of this is through ingestion, um, whether this is inhalation, then these will have different effects depending on where they ultimately end up. So this is a very complex matter and the un understanding is, is that it's not even just an effect that is um, just the same as one, uh, 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 the same effect as you go through your life. Um, we know that this has different effects at different stages. At pregnancy level, um, we can, and if you're exposed as a pregnant woman, then you can have low birth weight. It can, it can increase the chance of premature births. During um, sort of newborns, that you get some impacts on neurodevelopment and cognitive ability, which can ultimately affect the later life. With smaller children, ones that are exposed um, to particulates on a regular um, basis, can end up developing wheezing, then asthma, and then ultimately that can lead into real um, problems with lung function and lung inflammation later on. And children generally are seen as being exposed a little bit more because they breathe more rapidly and take in more pollutants. So when we think about hotspots such as school gates where lots of cars congregate, we really need to think about actually we're exposing some of our most vulnerable individuals there. And of course, this continues as we go through adults, adults and as we get a little bit older, where these asthma and um, heart attacks and, and lung um, diseases all come to the forefront because we have compromised our first line of defence at an earlier age. Now, one different effect that has really come into the limelight sort of right now this year as 2020 is this idea of um, whether COVID 
has greater mortality rates if you are, have suffered from poor air. So if you live in an area of poor air quality, are you more likely to get a higher death rate in, in due to COVID-19? And what we're looking at here is um, the Milan Cathedral. This is in the Lombardy region. And they were mapping and trying to understand the changes, firstly, in, in air pollution and air quality from before COVID and now after COVID. In fact, this image is a heat map with the amount of pollutants in the air. This one much darker shows there was a lot more in March, April last year than there was in March, April this year. So there's some understanding about that, but what they also found was this is a real hotspot for air pollution because of the Italian Alps around there and this, this gathering of air pollution. And they believe that actually that meant that um, they were doubling the death rate, mortality rate in, in for COVID-19. Now there's been a lot of other studies that have taken this idea and tried to start understanding it. And there was a large study by Harvard University in the US that looked at over 3,000 um, different counties in the, in the US, tried to see whether there was any correlation between poor air quality that had been tracked over many, many years, up to 2016, to the um, COVID-19 fatalities that we were seeing this year. And there were finding that there's these hot spots like New York City that has some of the highest um, PM 2.5s, also had some of the highest um, uh, fat number of fatalities. But this is an issue that is incredibly difficult to, to, to kind of investigate because so many other complex factors involved. And I think the main thing to take out at this point when we've got so very limited research in this is that there's a lot more studying need to be done. And if nothing else, the presence of poor air quality has altered our first line of defence. So we could imagine being more prone or suffer more heavily from something like COVID-19 than if we weren't exposed to that. So just on the last bit, I just want to move into sort of this particulate matter now that allows us to sort of think, well, what other kind of sources of, of airborne pollutant are there? So as well as all these ones from the sort of combustion of fuels, we've also got ones that are very much unseen and these are microplastics which are also a particulate something that i do a lot of work in and try to understand how how much microplastics are in all environments now the microplastics that we would see in the air and that ultimately could be inhaled by us are not the larger end of a microplastic because a microplastic can be anything up to five millimeters in size because they're just too big too heavy too dense to become airborne but in fact what we're interested in is much smaller sizes of microplastics that can float and transport in the air and a lot of these might be nanoplastics so these are in a much much smaller size range just to give you an idea of where that fits with our more commonly known pollutants just looking at this here this just shows sort of what pm 2.5 and pm 10s look like compared to a human hair so they're incredibly small when we're talking about our nanoplastics we're talking about ones that go into the nano range which is even smaller and just to show you where we're talking about with nanoplastics that go airborne, when we're going into micrometers and we're going into this zone here, which is where we might normally see these kind of organisms. So we're talking about incredibly small pieces of plastic that are allowed because of their size to be able to go airborne and then transport for many, many, many miles. Now, where are these coming from? You could probably guess. They're not coming from our primary sources of microplastic. So when we think of plastic pellets from the pe pellet industry, they're not coming from there. These are too big. Instead, they're coming from what we see as many, many different sources that form things like urban dust. And these are an accumulation of many different um, uh, types of microplastic. So a lot of these could be macroplastics that have broken down and degraded, and then they've become airborne. These could be from um, sludge byproducts um, that have become resuspended and suspended, and they become airborne as well. Um, a major source of this is synthetic fabrics from the clothes that we wear, and then when we wash them and then we use a dryer, they also become um, airborne and they're easily transferred. So there's lots of different sources, um, but one of the ones that maybe does get forgotten is from cars so when we think of trying to improve transportation we think well we'll go electric cars that will get rid of some of these emissions that would be excellent but in fact what actually happens is that they're also a continued source of microplastics so early this year a, a study came out and i did a piece on actually that looked at the amount of um, microplastics that are shed from car tires and from brake systems and it is fairly considerable because what we see 
is from just general use, not even overuse of cars, normal use of cars, we get microplastics that are shed directly from the tyres when they come into contact with the road, this mechanical abrasion as this breakdown. And then what we also get is they become airborne, and then we've got ones that have come from the braking system. So every time you press the brakes, we've got an abrasion, we wear away, and what we've got is a component of those that are also made of plastics. They're very complex components, the braking systems, and plastics is just one element of them. What we also have is road markings, our road paint, that when actually tyres run across them, they start to abrade, they are also becoming airborne. So we're getting this sort of three-way um, entry into the environment from just normal wear and tear of the cars. And a lot of people say, well, I thought tyres are, are just natural. Are they just natural rubber? But they're not. They are. They're made up of 50% natural and synthetic polymers. And when we think about um, just the synthetic part of this, they've actually found not only do they become airborne, but they can travel many, many miles and they can become suspended between uh, a study this done that I um, commented on was between 18 and 37 days. So there's a lot of time for them to remain in the air, for them to be inhaled by us, but also to get to very remote places. So let's just look at how much is in the air. There are very, very few studies that have looked at the amount of airborne plastic pollution. In fact, there's only been really nine locations ever studied, um, and eight of those looked at outdoor and one of those looked at indoor. And um, they, they, they're very, very few, but there was two done in Paris, three done in, in China, two in the UK, one in Scotland and two in Iran. So you can see that really doesn't show the representation of how much might be in the air. And a lot of these are just around urban, urban areas, so we don't even know what they're like in rural areas. But just putting these three, I'm just going to focus on these three just for a second. So we have a China lo location in Dongao, we have Paris and we have um, in London, the Thames, around the Thames area. And they look, they use passive sampling, they call air na natural atmospheric deposition. So these are just falling down, they capture how much has been collected from the air. And by looking at that, you get an idea of how many in a space, in a day, you might be exposed to. So I don't know whether you want to just, just personally try to guess which one you think might be the highest in terms of the amount of airborne plastics, whether that's China, whether that's France or whether in the UK. But I'll just show you what was found. So in China, between 175 to 313 partic particles per meter square per day. That's how much is it a concentration. In Paris, it was between 29 and 280. And in London, and you may or may not have thought this might be the highest, but it was between 575 and 1008 particles per meter squared. So a huge amount there potentially, but we know so little about this that the main thing that has been um, understood is that, well, actually, excuse me, going the wrong way. And um, main thing of recommendation is that we need more studies. We need to understand, take that limited knowledge about airborne pollutants and apply the same kind of veracity and enthusiasm that we've done for the marine environment, because we really, we much more understand the amount of microplastics in, in water environments than we do the air. So very quickly, I mean, how do we sample for all these pollutants? Uh, lots of different type of available um, items to be able to look at the likes of carbon monoxide. That's what you're looking at there. And you might even recognize that one at the bottom is something you can have in your own home. Um, we have samples, this is radio yellow that looks for nitrogen and sulfur ox oxides. This is a passive sampler that we, anal we use to analyze ozone in the air. And this one here looks at um, just general air quality, but particularly looking at our different um, salt, uh, our different nitrogen and oxides and sulfur oxides. And then we've got particulate measures that are used for this PM sampling, absolutely, but not necessarily used in microplastics. So we use a different technique when we look at microplastics. And we, we, we tried this out for the first time last summer when we were on an expedition along the Hudson River. So what we were trying to understand is what kind of um, microplastics are present, not just in the waterway, so the whole length of the Hudson River, but also on the land. So how, can that, how does that contribute into that river, but also in the air? So we were sampling the air every three miles for the whole length. And you've got to kind of use different, different methods for this. And just looking at atmospheric deposition, just capturing on a filter paper how much is there is not, is not good enough when we're sampling in, in this way because it's so dynamic, we're, we're on water. So we used a, a particulate um, filter pump system in order to be able to actively collect air. 
So we just use this pump here and we can set it up on land like we have here. This is just on the banks of the Hudson. And we just set it up so we can capture in this device here, along with a filter, anything that is stuck onto it from, from the air at that point, and microplastics and all other pollutants as well. So we did this in order to be able to look at all parts of the river. So we, we mounted it on small boats like this. And we also had it obviously on the, on the large boat. And this is the American Promise. And for us to try and understand how much uh, microplastics we might be inhaling at a height level, we had not only this air sampler um, taking samples out on the deck, but we also launched it right up towards the, the top of the mast and had it around eight or nine meters to try and capture that higher up amount of airborne particulates. Now, I'd love to tell you right there, like, oh, and this is exactly what we found. And we're, we're still going through the sample. So I really would like to, in a public lecture in the future, um, I would like to tell you all about those results and tell you how much is around Manhattan and along that Hudson River. But if you're interested in trying to understand how many microplastics you're exposed to, there's a little experiment that I'll just quickly tell you about. And this is something so easy to do. It's, it's looking at the atmospheric deposition in your own environment. And all you need is a sticky tape that you've been using for your Christmas presents already. So you should definitely have some of that in stock. So all you need to do is pick a nice part of the home that you would like to sample, maybe somewhere where lots of activity goes on, so kitchen and the living room. Take a small piece of your tape and then secure it sticky side up onto that surface. Now I've just stuck mine down here with a bit of masking tape on my desk. Um, any old tape will do. For when we're doing microplastic work and trying to collect this from the air on expeditions and in studies, we actually use this particular tape, which is something that's been designed specifically for an analysis in, in polymers. It's something we developed at staffs. But it's the same idea. We're going to capture it onto that sticky surface. Then all we want to do, leave it for a certain period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, all day. And then you just take that tape and stick it onto anything that's nice and clear. So of course I've got a microscope slide because I've got many of those at hand, but it could even just be a little glass plate, something that's see-through that allows you to get a magnifying glass and be able to actually see how many is on there. Um, if you've got a little handheld microscope, which they get these lovely USB ones and you can certainly use it for that and you can count how many were actually there. Um, that's going to tell you how much is deposited. So what was airborne and then ended up on your surface. Now, if I just sort of go, oh, there's some dust on here, then I'm actually looking at what the dust particulates that will have microplastics in it. So I know this happens. But if you want to understand how much you physically might be exposed to, although this is not massively scientific, it gives you an idea, is you could do the same thing with either double sided tape or just folding over a piece of tape and popping that on to your mask that you use when you go outside now, um, whether the, for, for obviously for prevention of COVID-19. You can stick it on there, do the same thing, put that down and see how many your particular area of, of, of breathing actually you came in contact with. So just if you want to try and see how many. Now let me end on this before I hand over. After we know they're there, we know we've got to get better understanding how much is there in terms of microplastic pollution in the air, but we do sort of already know some of these effects, some things we know better than others. We know that airborne microplastics can transport for many miles and many of these end up in our marine and our freshwater environments. And we know from that they are being ingested by our marine animals and then some of those end up through the food chain in order to be able also be, be consumed by us. We know that even if that doesn't happen and they're not something that we consume, they have effects on those organisms themselves. It affects reproduction, it increases um, mortality, um, so it, it increases uh, fatalities, it also um, reduces um, things like behaviour changes and reduces feeding. So it's we know a lot about this in that marine environment and we know that's where they can end up. What we also know is they can end up in other locations as well. So they can end up in taken along the wind to likes of Everest and Everest Base Camp. There's a study that's been done this year and they found microplastics in, in the whole of the Everest region, including uh, 400 metres from the summit of Everest. And they believe there's two sources of that. One of them, the trekkers themselves and from their clothes and, second, and, and secondary from airborne sources that have just travelled on the wind onto there. So even the most pristine locations can get um, polluted. And of course, by them being in the air, we have got the potential to inhale these. And by inhalation, we've got to try and understand, well, what does that really mean? Well, there's very, very little knowledge of the effect of inhaling microplastics at the moment and on human health. But what we do know is things that have been lent from um, things like textile industry, where we, people have actually studied 
um, individuals who've been exposed to primary sources. So those also that work in the asbestos industry. And it has been found that there are um, many different inflammations and the lung tissue leading to cancer um, that they have suffered from that we believe if we had a high, as high enough concentration, that's what our, our effect would be as well. But just to sort of note that we do know something around the effect of just particle matter inhalation anyway. So this here from Public Health England just shows the amount of incidence on here of things like um, heart disease, stroke, asthma, lung cancer, that if you in inhale just those particles of those sizes it can cause. And we know microplastics makes up a proportion of that, but yet to be understood of how, what that proportion really is. Now, finally, the last effect that gets forgotten completely is the effect of airborne microplastics entering our terrestrial systems. And our terrestrial systems are incredibly important, including for our food supply. And it is my pleasure right now to hand over to um, Ellie Harrison, who's my PhD student, who is the lead on terrestrial microplastics at Staffs Uni, and who is currently really fully understanding what that impact actually is. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Claire, for that introduction. Sorry, I'm just going to load up my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yeah, so as Claire said, I'm the terrestrial microplastics lead for our research group. Um, I'm a PhD student in the biological sciences department. And I'd probably say I sit in the environmental toxicology kind of thing. So I'm particularly interested in emerging pollutants and the impacts that they have on plant growth and development. Specifically, I focus on agriculture. And you might be thinking at this point, why are we talking about agriculture in a talk about air pollution? Um, but there's very much a two way relationship between agriculture and air pollution in that agriculture is a large um, factor in air pollution. So intensive agriculture is the um, largest producer of ammonia um, that goes into the environment. And we use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, which we know produces um, ozone as Claire's already covered there briefly. So agriculture is, you know, a massive part of air pollution and 70% of the UK's land there is used for agriculture. So we know that it's a big source for this kind of air pollution getting into the system. Now, at the same time, we also know that air pollution directly affects crop development. So we know that ozone, for example, can have really detrimental effects on plant development, which in turn has the possibility to impact global food security. So we know that um, 44 parts per billion of ozone is enough to reduce wheat development and wheat yield by up to 12 percent. We also know that the average in summer in the UK of ozone is about 50 parts per billion. So we know that we're seeing um, effects from this already just from the amounts of pollution that we've got in the environment. And soil is absolutely fantastic. That's why I absolutely love studying it. And also the terrestrial environment is where we get most of our food from. So I just want you to briefly think about what you've eaten today and have a rough guess at what percentage of our food you think comes from terrestrial sources. So I'm gonna put up some of the foods I probably have eaten today or this weekend. So cereal, I love cereal. Carrots, coffee, that's something I go through far too much. Potatoes, rice, cocoa, I love chocolate. So these are some of the things I've probably eaten in the past few days, uh, especially sprouts coming close to Christmas. Now, out of all of your food, probably about 95% of that comes from the terrestrial environment. So it comes from agriculture, whether that be meat products, dairy products or um, crops. So it's a really big part of our day to day life. So it's important to understand what impacts a ozone can have and emerging pollutants can have on this system and I really fit into this environment because I very much am in a hidden area of pollution so studying microplastics uh, there's a lot of work done in water and it's really really easy to sample water soil not so much most people walk past soil and don't think anything about it so this picture here we've actually got some plastic beads there mixed into this soil and it very much looks like the quartz materials or the mineral materials that you may naturally find in soils so it's a very much a hidden form of pollution it's not something that many people often think about and it's not something that many people look for either so 
my work specifically focuses on um, agriculture and the effects of microplastics in agricultural landscapes. Now, we've been talking about atmospheric microplastics, and this is one of the pathways that we see that microplastics are getting into terrestrial systems. So we see this atmospheric deposition um, of the microplastics, and like Claire spoke about in the Everest study, we see that this has um, negative impacts on soil and may end up getting stored in there. There's also been um, papers that have recently come out in this area looking at terrestrial plants as a temporary sink of atmospheric microplastics. So what they did is they went and they looked at these plant leaves and they collected any um, pollution or anything that they saw adhered to the surface of this leaf. And what they found is about 28% of the items that were stuck to these leaves were actually plastic um, particles, whether that be fibres or small fragments, adhered to the surface of these plants, which means that we know that this is going to be going into the soil in the long run. Um, so I am particularly interested about what happens when these plastics enter the soil and how this in turn affects our crop development and subsequently what this means in the state of kind of global food resources obviously we know that global food security is going to be an ever-increasing problem much the same as we see in air pollution because the population is getting larger and larger so my work so far has focused a lot on soil and plant interactions and how microplastics may impact plant growth so this is some of my recent work looking at plant growth in high levels of plastic in the soil. So we looked specifically at whether there was a potential for these plastics to change the soil structure in a way that had a negative impact on plants. And what we found is that some plants actually show nearly a 20% reduction in germination when exposed to high levels of plastic fibre in the soils. So rapeseed, for example, we saw a 17% reduction. You can see that on graph B there. Um, wheat, we saw a 10% reduction. If you remember a few minutes ago at the beginning of the talk, I've just said that ozone can deplete this by 12%. If we considered further reductions from microplastics, we're seeing very big impacts there on global food security. So I want to talk about this in economic costings. Um, one thing I think that happens is we talk about percentages a lot, but sometimes we need to put this into real world figures. So I had a little calculation about looking at the economic costings if we applied these negative impacts that we saw from microplastics into the cost for the EU's production of crops. Now, wheat, for example, is one of the largest um, items produced from the EU in terms of agriculture. It's a massive industry. Agriculture is worth billions and billions of pounds. So we calculated what we thought would happen if we saw a 10% reduction in wheat yield. So we think here we're assuming that a germination ultimately, a lack of germination would ultimately lead to reduced crop yield. And what we found was that we can see a four billion pound decrease in, in monetary value from that 10% reduction. If we consider that on top of what we think might happen with the wheat market with um, high ozone levels, which we think could be up to 6.7 billion pounds, you can see that economically, the impact of these emerging pollutants and of air pollution on our overall um, agricultural economy is absolutely huge. So for example, we also found in um, Bali, we had a four, uh, 400 million pound reduction there in the overall economic cost. So this is a massive impact that we're seeing. So I think one thing that we need to think about this, so I know John's gonna touch on this a bit further. So I'm particularly interested in how global food insecurity um, can impact this and how reductions in germination could lead to further insecurity throughout the world. And what we know is that this is a socio-economic um, issue. We know that in areas of um, lower economic household income, that we're going to see more of these food insecurities. But this also directly links back to air pollution. So I'm going to show you another graph. Right now. I'm going to switch back. So this is deaths from air pollution. Now you can see we've got quite a lot of this with no data and the same on the previous graph. But what we do notice is in areas with higher food insecurities, we tend to see the same effects from air pollution. So we know that these are interlinked issues. Um, we know that 
economically this is an issue and we know that in lower economic countries that we're more likely to see a global food insecurities and b there's more likely to be higher impacts from air pollution in these areas so these two issues go hand in hand so I want to hand back over to um, John in a second, who's going to talk a little bit more about the um, economic and the socioeconomic factors that go into air pollution there. Um, I also wanted to leave with some experiments. So Claire's just give you a couple of experiments, but I'm all up for people trying out these soil experiments at home. So firstly, what you could do, you could do this either with compost. So you might be surprised to know, um, I use a lot of compost in my experiments. But every time I use compost, I find massive amounts of plastic in there. So you could take some compost, sieve this and see what macroplastics you could pull out or what large scale microplastics. Um, you could also do something called a density separation. And this is something we use quite commonly in the lab. And what you're going to need is some salt and some water and a beaker to pour this in. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration now of how this works. So I've got my soil or sand at the bottom here that is containing lots of microplastics in there. I am going to add a denser solution. And what should happen is because these plastic particles are lighter than the solution, they should float up to the top. So we add in our water, our salt water there, and we're going to see that these plastic particles rise to the top where you can collect these and have a little look at them. So like Claire mentioned, if you've got one of these pocket microscopes, that would be absolutely brilliant to look at those. Um, and you can have a little try of that at home. In addition to that, you could also do similar to what Claire said, but stick some sellotape on the top of your plant leaf and see how many uh, microfibers or microplastics are adhering to that plant leaf every day. Um, you could do the same. So looking at the glass there, putting the glass, put it on a glass material and have a look, have a count and see what kind of deposition you're seeing on your office plants or from your plants at home, uh, from your plants in the garden and see what you're finding. Um, so at this point, I want to hand back over to John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just a, a few slides really to pull things together. Um, so, so mainly one of the things we were thinking about, or I've been working on, is procedural aspects. And what should we be doing about this, and, and why should we be doing stuff? And I suppose the first thing is to look at the Ostrava Declaration, which was signed in 2017 uh, by the EU on behalf of European governments. And here it talks explicitly about considering equity, social inclusion, gender equality, and policies linked on the environment and health. Uh, and then secondly, a second quote from that document was about improving indoor and outdoor air quality for all as it's the most important environmental risk factor um, and to try and improve continuous process of improvement of air quality because it's known to have so many um, negative impacts. And we, we've looked at the vulnerability. Vulnerability can happen in two ways. Either you can live in an area which has higher levels of air pollution than other areas or you are more vulnerable because of the type of person you are. So, you know, if you're a pregnant woman or you're a child, you're more vulnerable to uh, the air pollution that's going on compared to, say, um, a healthy a man, for example. Um, so the, this brings into account issues of equity. It's not, it's, not, it's not just about having equal measures. We have to consider equity here because some people are more vulnerable. And when we look at the sources of pollution, um, we've got general ambient air pollution, but we've also got industrial pollution sites. And this graph is from a study I did in Scotland in about 2005. And decile one uh, is the 10% of most deprived areas and decile 10 is the least deprived areas. And you can see here a very clear social gradient. So the more deprived, um, you are and the area you live in, the more likely you are to be close to an industrial pollution site. So that was the figure uh, we did for Scottish government. We did this in England for the Environment Agency. Uh, you can see again, a very strong uh, inequality there. So people in decile one were what, about seven times more likely to live near uh, within one kilometre of an IPC site, which are uh, the most, most polluting type of sites. Uh, and when we looked at other things, we could look at emissions. So this is the total amount of carcinogenic substances to air from those sites. 
you can see they were very heavily concentrated in the most deprived areas. And this kind of work has been uh, you know, quite well known. Uh, I've recently, uh, last couple of years, been involved with the World Health Organization, and I carried out a systematic review with colleagues from Germany. Um, and we're seeing here again, we looked at all sorts of different things, what are related to it. So we could look at ethnicity, occupation, but the ones that come out much most are indices and economic position. So those people who have a uh, low economic position or high index of multiple deprivation, more likely to be experiencing poor air quality. Um, and this, these are for studies that were done at the city or regional scale. This is right across Europe. Again, very much the case that indices of deprivation uh, for studies across Europe right across Europe show that those areas experience worse air quality, okay? Um, and so the evidence that we found, um, PM 2.5s and PM 10s that Claire and uh, Ellie have talked about, also nitrogen, NO2 and NOx. We also found that ethnic minorities uh, sometimes uh, had an issue as well. Uh, not always, it depends on the ethnic minority under consideration. Um, and when we looked at pregnant mothers or new mothers, again, we found those mothers who were in deprived areas or had some link to ethnicity, more likely to have poorer air uh, quality. So what can you do about this? Here's an interesting one. Um, jo Gideon is the local MP for Stoke-on-Trent, one of the local MPs. She's written a nice blog on this. And the Environment Bill is currently in Parliament. And there's a lot of lobbying going on for the government to adopt the World Health Organization standards. Uh, there's a link here that will be made available to you, so you can go on there uh, if you want to lobby uh, your MP. Um, what else can you do? Well, if you're, a, if you're watching this and you work in a health authority or a local authority or a charity or an NGO or you're just a concerned citizen, then there's this toolkit which I helped develop with the World Health Organization. It gives you a very good introduction to this topic. Um, it gives you stuff like how to carry out an equity sensitive analysis, uh, which you could present to people. Uh, you could give it to your counselor, or you could ask the health authority that this is what you want. There's a range of toolkits we pulled together as well, which talk about decision-making uh, and governance. So again, if you're working in any of those sorts of local health authorities, local authorities, uh, charities, NGOs, uh, you can have a look and there's a lot of information in there. So if you're very new to this area and you want to learn more, uh, you can certainly have a look at that. Um, there are large standing processes that we've signed up to as a government maybe 20 years ago, uh, which look at these. This is the Our House Convention. Um, so you can get environmental information, you can be involved in decision making processes as well. And then uh, we put some resources for you together at the end. So I've just given you a very quick run through this, but all of the stuff that I've been talking about and we've been talking about are on these links, which we're gonna make available to you. Uh, so you can have a look at them, use them in, in your own work if you want. And here's some, uh, also some easier, uh, so easier stuff to look at. Uh, so articles that come from the Guardian, uh, some nice articles there. Also, if you've got scientific interest, here's some of the systematic reviews uh, that have been done recently on air quality and the link to health. Um, and it's almost certainly the case, uh, given all the evidence that has, has grown over the last uh, 10 years, where are we now? 15 years, because 2005 was the last time these were updated. It's almost certainly the case that who are going to recommend tightening a lot of the standards uh, for health benefits. Um, if you want to, uh, we've also put you information at the end. So we're active on Twitter, um, where our researchers' pages are, where our publications are. So there's Claire's there. Um, here's mine. If you're interested in air quality specifically, um, I've got a list on Twitter, uh, which a lot of people use. So you can have a look at that, but you can get my stuff here. And there's Ellie's uh, Twitter and LinkedIn as well, if you want to talk to her. So um, that's just very quick for me because I think we're just about on time and I'm going to hand back over to uh, Sally. Hi, thank you for that, John, Claire and Ellie. Um, if you do have any questions, everybody, 
um, please do drop them into the question box. I have had some that have not come through here, but have come through separately if you guys are ready. This one is a three part question, so do just bear with me. <laughs> okay, uh, it is topical though for the winter. As we move deeper into winter and more and more urban area log burners are put to use, do you think public perception of this trendy green energy source is that it is green? Do people fully recognise how much pollution they're exposing their neighbours and themselves to? And if not, what is the way forward? Educate or ban new appliances? Uh, I, I can start with that if you want. Um, yeah. Wood burning stoves are the single largest source of PM 2.5 in Western Europe. They've actually been increasing over the last 10 years because of the growth of wood burning stoves. Um, they are a disaster in health terms. Um, they are being widely used in urban areas, which are in many cases smokeless zones. Um, even the government, I think, recognises that they're bad, but they haven't been prepared to take much action. So they're talking about new stoves coming in next year and you only being able to burn uh, dry wood and other things like that. But that, that's quite honestly, that's, that's very similar to what happened with cigarette smoking, where they said, oh, smoke like cigarettes. It's, it's exactly the same. They really need to go out of urban areas because they are a, a health disaster. Does anyone else think, have anything to say on that? I think just to add around what would work, I think many, many people don't know the, the, the sheer impact of having a wood burning stove on the environment generally, and but also on themselves. Um, because they're ex directly exposing themselves to this as a pollutant. And I, I don't think that's very widely well spread really as a, as a message. So I think it needs a combination of both really. To ban it, like many things, when we ban, we ban something or we put some sort of levy against it, it will reduce it. We only need to look at the plastic bag um, sort of ban or 5p levy on it um, in order to see that and the effect of that. But I think education is the real first step because um, pe people are going to be really upset being told they can't have something that is, is really homely, it's something that you, you really like, it's a key part of your home. Um, so I think education comes first and then if required, then a ban. That's brilliant. Um, we don't seem to have had any other questions this evening come through. Um, I don't know if Sally, if you want to um, mention anything else to do with university sustainability at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the university um, has relaunched its sustainability brand, Sustain Staffs, and has a new um, strategic framework around sustainability. Um, and we would encourage people to look at that, find that online, and to think about um, not just the things that university is going to be able to do in terms of improving the types of buildings that we have, the way that we use energy, the potential to maybe generate energy online or to take more energy from re renewables but also we would encourage people to think about their own behaviors as well so just like John was saying um, you know that, that wood burning stoves are not are not very good people maybe thinking more about where um, things that they that they're using are coming from so where are their clothes where's their clothing coming from um, you know how many journeys are they making in their car um, all, all of these things so um, we would encourage people to sort of to, to think about their own behaviors as well as um, think about what we're going to be doing um, at the university towards the sustainability agenda. So thank you very much. Um, are, are we, is that all our questions? Is that? Um, no, we just had another one pop through, Sally, while one. you were talking. Okay. Um, it said, thank you for this talk, very interesting. Professor Gwinnett said we should discount other sources such as water quality when considering air pollution effects on human bodies. This presents a challenge for regulators. Legislation is quite specific by sector with specific monitoring limits by emissions to media, land, air, water, etc. Do you think we regulators need to adapt our approach and take a more holistic view to the industries we regulate? Who would like to start? Should I, should I start that? Is, that? is that okay? I think absolutely a, a, a holistic approach, trying to understand these many sources um, and how they interconnect with each other is, is the only way forward to truly know the abundance of this pollutant from different sources. Um, by segmenting these away from each other, um, you're, 
you're losing the opportunity of understanding this transportation of this pollutant and then you only see part of the picture so i think if i understood the question correctly in terms of creating a more holistic approach to inform regulation re regulators try to get a better understanding of the types of mitigation activity that should be put in place and holistic ways is certainly the way forward okay so i've got another question ellie brilliantly illustrated countries vulnerability to food insecurity due to terrestrial microplastic pollution uk government have recently been promoting the concept of natural capital does natural capital estimate consider these types of studies could this help bring historically opposing standpoints in agricultural sector hundreds of money often significant consideration with environmental regulators environmental standards using primary factor so i think it's quite a difficult one to kind of comment on there in terms of um pushing so we're on about natural can you just clarify natural resource there did you say yeah yeah okay so i think that's quite a difficult one and um everywhere i go has a very much different approach to how they tackle this um now i think in terms of my area and that's really all i can speak about specifically on that point um is that the terrestrial microplastic thing as a contaminant is not currently classed as a contaminant so i would not say that that's necessarily taken into account in terms of the effects that that can have on a economy and b the environment both of those being you know important as each other economy and environment have got to work together in that sector um so in terms of that my specific research area probably isn't taken into account um it's really only become an emerging focus recently so i think at the minute it's difficult to comment on that yeah i don't know whether claire has anything more to say on the policy side of things but or john i think we, 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 the thing I always say this, um, but what helps guide policy is also empirical data and, and really trying to understand the extent of, and if you're just looking at Ellie's area now, that extent of pollution and that fate of pollution is really important because what we do know, there's many other factors that might actually lead to policy change quicker. So it could be that airborne pollutants, not it's not, and, and say microplastics themselves, it might not be that that, that triggers policy change because of a link with human health. In fact, it could be some of the chemicals that it's adsorbed onto its surface. And if we think terrestrial systems, they, they might be exposed to pesticides and fertilizers. And it's that combination of, of feet characteristics that then subsequently has effect on um, human health. And then um, can, that can ultimately help drive policy. And I know that kind of went on a side note to that there, but in terms of what kind of drives that kind of thing forward, it's, it's around understanding that empirical data. And as an emerging pollutant, Ellie's investigating really early stages. Yeah, I mean, we don't even have data on the amount of microplastics found in soil and agricultural land in the UK. Um, we're really, really lacking on data in this area at the moment. It really is just coming into focus now. Um, so there's only three studies on plant growth at the minute. So we'll hopefully, like Claire said on the last one, if you let me give another public lecture at some point, I'll tell you all about my work and the work that I do on agriculture and what we're finding. Lovely. And just one last question then. What effect will climate change models have on the distribution and properties of microplastics? By properties, I mean, could there be an increase in toxicity more likely to be suspended in air, perhaps likelihood for particle size to change, even when production source such as vehicle brakes is the same? Interesting question. I like that question. That's a fabulous question. I think, oh, good. <laughs> first of all, just acknowledging the fact that the idea of microplastic pollution, air pollution and climate change, they're not separate, they are all interlinked, is, is hugely important and I think that is not necessarily understood uh, like generally. So the idea of how climate will change and its sources of, of natural pollutants is one, one aspect of this, but in terms of what the effect on microplastics are, I think you've just picked an amazing point because at the moment, we when we think about microplastics and let's just look at the human health aspect of it or any studies that have been done have been done on primary microplastics ones that have not been through an environmental change degradation absorbing chemicals and all of the their life in the air and where and, and through the systems they've moved to before being inhaled by us and the likes of climate change is directly linked 
to this idea of what happens to those particulates, what they're exposed to, and then subsequently that's linked to what's going to affect to us. And at the moment, we don't have that knowledge at all because there's not even any studies really done on that non-primary. And, and, and I mentioned very briefly that we, we borrow a lot of our knowledge of what that effect might be on us from the textile industry type studies. Um, and that sort of understanding of that link between climate and what's it changed in terms of particle size, particle morphology, and then us, massively needed. And I think that is one of the main push areas at the moment. It's just a review paper that's been done. Um, and it's December 2020 that's just been released. One of the key messages is around trying to understand that problem. So uh, whoever asked that question, amazing, because you're ahead of the game. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's the end of the question. So I'll hand over to Sally just to say some closing remarks. Thank you. So thank you very much to Claire, to Ellie and to Joanne for a fascinating um, lecture this evening. So that's the last for this year of our Profs in the PAV in, in the sustainability series. Um, and that was a, a, an eye opening um, explanation of the impact that pollution is having on, on all of us in ways that we probably hadn't even haven't realised before. Uh, before we heard that this evening. So thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much to our audience as well um, who are tuning in, whether you're watching it on Monday evening or whether you're watching it on the repeat. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, questions and your contributions. Um, and um, I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.